What do you call a political trick masquerading as a legal process? A charade? That's what first comes to my mind. Eight years ago, on July the 12th, 2016, a so-called arbitral tribunal housed in the Peace Palace in The Hague handed down a so-called South China Sea Arbitration Award that's been hailed by the West as a victory against Chinese hegemony in the South China Sea and used as a basis to criticize China. I was, by the way, reporting on the case in front of and inside the Peace Palace at the time. Now, China did not agree to the jurisdiction of the tribunal and hence never recognized the legality of this case. Eight years on, it seems that the situation has gone from bad to worse in the region. What was behind China's non-participation? How far back can we trace this let's see each other in court approach by Western powers? Welcome to a special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, coming to you from Beijing. I'm pleased to be joined from um, Hainan, southern China's uh, uh, Hainan Island, by Yan Yan, director of the Research Center of Oceans Law and Policy at the National Institute for South China Sea Studies, from Brisbane, Australia, by Warwick Powell, adjunct professor of Queensland University of Technology, and from Beijing, by Anna Rosario Malindog, Vice President for External Affairs of the Asian Century Philippines Strategic Studies Institute. Uh, warmly welcome to all of you to the point. Now, uh, Ms. Yen Yen, let me go to you first. The Philippines unilaterally initi initiated the procedure in 2013 despite China's objection. So what was the case all about to begin with? Well, the dispute between China and the Philippines is actually the dispute over the sovereignty of these island features um, in the uh, Nanshan Chundao and Zhongshan Chundao, and also a dispute of maritime delimitation. Well, the uh, tribunal erroneously addressed separately the, se the status of the component features of China's Nanshan Chundao and Zhongshan Chundao and territorial and maritime delimitation dispute. So, in fact, I think the tribunal had made a series of mistakes um, regarding jurisdiction, admissibility, the uh, termination, nature, and content of the disputes, so which basically, uh, violated spirits and principle of international law. So basically, and help us understand, imagine someone who has no idea of the history. There are these islands that China claim are Chinese and the Philippines claim were the Philippines. Uh, so the Philippines brought China to court, uh, so to speak, in this arbitral tribunal that was formed for the specific case, but China rejected that the jurisdiction, that the court had jurisdiction. Tell us a bit about the history of the, the, the case. What was the Philippines going after? Well, actually, uh, the dispute, as I, men I already mentioned, between China and the Philippines is, is a dispute over the sovereignty over these features in the two island groups. Well, knowing that the tribunal has no jurisdiction of the dispute concerning sovereignty issues, the Philippines tries to, well, very wisely, uh, tries to disguise the issue as a dispute over the interpretation and application of the clauses and provisions of the UNCLOS in order to drag China into the compulsory arbitration under Annex 7 of the UNCLOS. Okay, a lot of jargons there already. Uh, well, we, so the UNCLOS is the United Nations uh, Convention of the Laws of the Seas. Um, what was the Filipino side accusing China of violating and why did China believe that it had legitimate reasons not to um, be engaged in the jurisdiction, in the, in the procedure? Look, I think it's important to bear in mind that the UNCLOS actually only came into effect in the early 1980s and that it came into effect on the presumption that all sovereignty questions were already settled or were knowingly settled between different nation states. So that was the assumption made in the way that UNCLOS came into existence and continues to operate. In other words, UNCLOS does not deal with sovereignty questions. It deals with the obligations of nations in relation to different um, features um, related to the oceans um, on the assumption that sovereignty questions have already been resolved. So in this regard, the arbitration manoeuvre um, by the Philippines, in effect, um, jumped the gun. Paul, how did the Philippine side believe that it could successfully jump the gun by not talking about sovereignty issues 
by uh, through you know talking about the the definition of the so-called features, whether they are islands or low tide elevations. How did they believe this could work? Well, I think it tried to, in a sense, um, avoid the fundamental issues at stake and shift the ways in which the questions were being perceived by others in the international community. Ultimately, though, until the questions of sovereignty are actually addressed in only the ways that the questions of sovereignty can be, um, the issues aren't going to go away. And there is absolutely no point leaning on the UNCLOS processes as a way of solving a problem that they weren't designed or in, envisaged to be able to solve anyway. The um, UNCLOS or the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea d stipulates that the arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction is confined to quote unquote any dispute concerning the interpretation or application of this convention. It also allows nations to declare their non acceptance of compulsory dispute settlement procedures regarding quote unquote disputes concerning sea boundary delimitation, which China did. China declared that it will not accept this kind of uh, compulsory dispute settlement. Um, China did that in 2006, and there are a bunch of other countries which also made that declaration. Um, Ms. Malin Dogui, let me go to you. Why, when China said, no, we are not going to engage in this case, um, it got criticized by not just the Philippines, but a lot of Western countries as well as a, some kind of indication of China is afraid to go to court or China does not uh, abide by international rule of law. Well, I think the, the very reason why the Philippines during that time wants to uh, went, went to court vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis China is not necessarily, but I think we're not stupid not to see that actually on close is not the venue when you talk about settling territorial disputes, especially when you talk about sovereignty. But for me, from my vantage point, it's really all about shaming China and putting China on the spotlight in the international community as if um, trying to galvanize support that, you know, I mean, the Philippines is being bullied by China in that sense. But again, then again, to a greater extent, if you really look at the tribunal award, it did not really settle sovereignty issues. It just clarified the maritime rights of the Philippines. And even then, it weakened our claim in the South China Sea because it even declared the Saskarbaroo Shoal as a traditional fishing ground. Um, by which every claimant states like China, um, Vietnam, and the Philippines can fish. A arbitral award even ruled that Ayungin Shoal is not within its competency, precisely because the Ayungin Shoal issue is a military issue that is not competent enough to settle. So if you really look at it from the my vantage point, it's more about, uh, you know, a media hype. It's more about uh, trying really to put China on the spotlight thinking that probably um, countries in the international community will be on our side. But look, there's only the G7 that's really like, you know, pushing and um, to a certain extent supporting the arbitral award. But the rest of ASEAN countries are very quiet and even the rest of Asia Pacific is quiet about it. That's the reality really of the, this so-called arbitral award. I'm not, I'm just being honest and I'm just being, you know, frank about this. Hmm. Despite the fact that if you really look at the Philippines at the moment, it's really something that, the, you know, that you, the current government and even some Filipinos would, you know, push for that, you know, China should acknowledge. But of course, China from the very start did not participate in the proceedings. And China, I think, will never acknowledge that arbitral award. And that's a fact and that's a reality that we Filipinos have to contend to. Hmm. Well, um, at the moment, there was a lot of hype indeed, um, Ms. Um, Malan Dogui. Um, there was a lot of talk of China being afraid or not uh, living up to, you know, um, its promise uh, to respect international rule of law. Um, Yen Yen, what is your um, reflection thinking, looking back at that period of time? And still, and still, I would say, even if some people like Ms. Malindogui has come to this realization, still some people in the Western world or pundits in the Western media would use this case as um, as if China is the, the bad guy who, who despised international rule of law. Well, 
Actually, I think that the ruling itself does not constitute international law. According to Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, ICJ, the source of international law include um, international treaties, international custom and general principles of law and judicial proceedings and uh, doctrines of scholars and public law. Well, they all may serve the sources of international law. I think that the uh, instead of contributing to the interpretation and application of the UNCLOS, um, the South China Sea arbitra arbitration award undermines the international rule of law. So, um, well, what China did, China's uh, policy of non-acceptance uh, non and non-recognition of the award is actually precisely a legitimate and just act to uphold the integrity and authority of the convention and especially rule of law. Would you give a concrete example? I mean, okay, we've heard quite a bit, but again, when you say that the tribunal is undermi has undermined the authority of the international rule of law here, uh, represented by the UNCLOS, uh, how exactly is that? As you already mentioned, as, as early as uh, the, the July, August 25th, 2006, the Chinese government already submitted a written statement to the uh, Secretary of the UN, making it very clear that the dispute concerning maritime delimitation, um, territorial uh, disputes and military activities did not accept the uh, juris, uh, international jurisprudence or arbitration as in shine in this um, part uh, 15 of the UNCLOS. And also uh, this statement was based on Article 298 of the UNCLOS. However, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tribunal wanted to expand its uh, jurisdiction over the case and wanted to uh, increase its uh, impact in the international law society thus it make this make the decision that it has jurisdiction over the case mm. and i think that uh, uh the uh, tribunal did made a series of mistakes regarding jurisdiction admissibility uh, the nature and content of the dispute therefore it is uh, a challenge mm. to the current rule of law system let us find out a bit more about the details and what we, if you can tell us more about, on that regard, is how this tribunal was formed because it's actually not the so-called United Nations Court or as some people would uh, assume, it's actually a ad hoc panel of uh, five judges which were picked um, pretty much on the basis of uh, the personal opinion of one person. Could you tell us a bit about the procedures of the formation of that tribunal and hence its legitimacy? Well, part of the problem with this whole process is that it emerged without the consent of all the parties and therefore immediately its entire legitimacy was subject to a cloud of doubt. As you mentioned, the formation of this tribunal was an ad hoc process and without the agreement of parties who are supposedly um, the, the active parties within a dispute, in agreement with process, with the, with the presiding judging panel, um, you're never going to get the legitimacy that these kinds of bodies need if decisions that they arrive at are to actually hold weight. And that's exactly what we've seen. It's a very unfortunate example of where international bodies has been exploited in what is really an extra judicial manner to pursue public relations stunts rather than pursue black letter, letter law outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, where this goes from here, of course, um, we're witnessing the consequences now of what was actually quite an irresponsible pathway chosen because the issues haven't been addressed, the issues haven't been resolved, and we continue to have the problems that we see today. The exercise engaged in a decade ago did not help in reaching a resolution. How was this able to happen? Um, I seriously wonder because if you read historical documents, especially the historical archives dug out by Professor Anthony um, Carty, whom I interviewed, who did a detailed, prolonged study into the national memories of the United States, of France and of UK, he found out a trove of uh, historical records which indicated that, and, and, and very interestingly to me, that.
whenever there were some kind of disputes among the colonial imperialist powers concerning some islands that are thousands of miles away from their home, but in this part of the world, in our part of the world, they would say, shall we go to arbitration? Shall we go to court? Shall we go to arbitration? It seems to me that this, I'll see you in court, um, practice is a time-honored old trick that has been employed and proven useful again and again by imperialist powers. Is this, um, Ms. Malindogui, is this a continuation of that tradition of using international law to pursue imperialistic and colonial interests? Yes, it could be. If you really look at the Philippines, it's very much heavily influenced by Americans in, in many ways. And I think even the pushing and even the, the filing of the case in The Hague is also an influ uh, it, it, it has very much influenced by the by the Americans. So, you know, this is much more about it's not really about international law or anything for that matter. It's really making it's just all about putting China on the spotlight. And, you know, th that that's really the bottom line of everything. And also, um, uh, filing cases in the international, uh, in, the, in, in whatever court, maybe a tribunal or whatsoever, as far as China is concerned, I don't see really it as, you know, it's it's really the Asian way of settling the dispute. So if you really look at the country, uh, my country, and how the, you know, how they kind of resolve such kind of issue, that's not really the Asian way, it's more a Western way of settling dispute, which I don't agree. Because for me, if you want to settle the dispute in the South China Sea with China, it's better for, for us to have a bilateral talks negotiation with China, use diplomacy rather than, rather than lawfare. That, that, you know, it, it would never end up with anything. And also, it's better also to probably think more about joint possible joint activities with China that both countries benefit rather than filing cases, which I think another case would be up there coming, you know, uh, as far as we are concerned, as far as the Philippines concerned. So I think it's more it's more the Western way of dealing with conflict, not the Asian way. And for me, the best course forward for the Philippines is to discuss this with China, talk it out with China, negotiate with China, have joint activities in the South China Sea, like you know, joint fishery management and all of these things, environmental protection, people, I think this is the way forward. Some people would say, well, now China is much bigger than the Philippines. China is much, much more powerful than many of its uh, neighbors, especially in Southeast Asia. Is it possible for China to listen to these smaller in size countries? And can there be equal consultation and results that are fair and beneficial to both, to both sides? I, I I think it's not about it's not be, it's not about being big or small. I think it's about respect. It's about being open minded. And I see China being open minded to negotiation and I think to working together to preserve the peace and security and stability of the South China Sea. I see it. And, they, and there's there's a lot of that kind of talks and like kind of negotiation, even possibility of joint. Um, activities in the South China Sea between the Philippines and China during the Duterte administration. So this is not possible. It's it's not that China's big or something to that effect. It's really more about talks and negotiation and trying to look at the South China Sea as a regional public good rather than a dispute or a source of dispute. And I believe China is very pragmatic as a country and very mature. And I don't think China would want to escalate any kind of dispute or tension in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. I think China's strategy is more about, you know, trying to have that cooperation, win-win cooperation between claimant states and, of course, between itself. Um, Yen Yen, you just heard that maybe there are other cases, you know, uh, upcoming. Um, hopefully, the similar kind of uh, charade will not be repeating itself as a farce. Uh, definitely not. What kind of loopholes we need to watch out for so that the international law and legal system will not be misappropriated again by people who have uh, illegitimate self-interest to push for? Well, first of all, I wanted to add one specific and um, detailed case of how the uh, arbitral tribunal's uh, procedure does have a flaw. Well, I just it just came to my mind that I remember that uh, back in the year uh, 2016, April the 12th, well, the tribunal completed the appointment of the independent experts well, on April the 12th. And then uh, on the issue of the protection of marine environmental protection. However, only after seven 
17 days. Well, the uh, report, the expert expert report was um, issued on April the 29th. So the procedure, uh, the process of omission of evidence is actually highly questionable to many scholars and many people in the international law uh, world because this, uh, well, their um, uh, final finding, well, did have a huge impact on the uh, on the uh, the uh, interpretation of the on clause and also on the interpretation of a legal status of the features and also on mar maritime environmental protection mm. issues so this is a more uh, and a detailed example of how um, the procedural flaws is exist in the uh, arbitral tribunal mm. and second i want to mention about um well the previous question regarding the, the big whole, country or small yeah. nation okay. yes we we do see that there are many examples of china of uh, dealing very good with our neighbors no matter big or small um of maritime boundary delimitation dispute well for example of uh, china and vietnam um, finished our maritime boundary in the Gulf of Tonkin, Beibu Wan, uh, Beibu Gulf, in the year 2000. We have a friendly negotiation for more than 20 years, and then uh, we signed the uh, agreement on the year 2000. We now have a fishing um, cooperation and joint patrol in the Gulf of Tonkin for like more than 20 years. So this is a very good example of China did can deal with our neighbors with a friendly, uh, uh, through friendly mm -hmm. negotiations to deal with, with our maritime yeah. boundary dispute. And very good example of that. Mm -hmm. And also this is a 70 year of the Chinese principle of uh, peaceful coexistence of right. the five principle. So I think that we do, I do have a, uh, I, I do have a, a hope for um, the future settlement of the dispute with yeah. other neighbors in the South China Sea, especially mm -hmm. the Philippines. Um, Powell, certainly it is not in China's interest to have uh, conflicts broken out, especially hostile uh, hostilities broken out uh, around China, in China, because we really want to focus on economic development. But again, um, what will help people differentiate between a serious uh, tribunal or arbitration and a show trial? Well, the critical factor here, Lucien, is that you need a format in which the parties to a dispute or a disagreement both agree on. I mean, without that, there is no legitimacy. And until there is an agreement on, firstly, the nature of the questions at stake and the appropriate forum in which those issues are addressed, we're never going to move past what has been to date a PR-driven exercise Fundamentally, the first issues to be resolved go to those of sovereignty, and they're not dealt with through UNCLOS. The other issues in terms of collabor collaborations and management and things are part and parcel of how that how the issues are dealt with subsequently. But, um, but, but they are different things, and that's the point. What's happened to date is that the, uh, the, the, the general media, if you will, the mainstream media in the West has quite happily conflated these issues into a single undifferentiated um, mass of issues painted really as a question of big versus small when of course they're not that at all and we need to get clarity on what the issues are identify the right jurisdiction the right forums whereby all involved parties actually are committed to a pathway forward collectively. Mm. And it is really so um, gullible, you know, people can be so gullible when we see a trial, our sense of justice or indignation may be fired up when you hear, you know, a long description of victim, uh, victimized statements and so on and so forth. But, and, and then people start to overlook the, uh, not ask the real serious question. Um, again, while we go, I want to stay with you a little bit more because it really struck me because that case, for instance, which was supposed to be held in a much smaller courtroom, was able to use the grandiose uh, UN courtroom with, of course, the logo of the UN covered up. And when people see that kind of optic, they immediately assume that this is a court of leg legitimacy of authority. And this is so deceiving. Um, again, as ordinary viewers, how can people differentiate between a show trial and a serious one. We have seen serious ones in recent time, right? The latest uh, on the, the violence that has been going on. I believe a lot of countries were involved and, they, and, and, I, and I believe China also supported this kind of arbitration or, or, or trial. But how can uh, a layman or a layperson differentiate what they're seeing in front of them, Powell? 
Look, when most of these activities are really designed as social media or public relations spectacles, in a world when the general person's attention span is no better than about eight seconds, it's actually very easy to exploit that sense of injustice that you get from the visual cues. But the fact is, is that these complex issues can only be addressed through ongoing communications, educating people around what the actual issues are and working through them in a systematic and peaceful way. There is no other practical way forward other than if you're only interested in creating show for the sake of show and driving um, a wedge, if you will, between people around issues that might fire up their emotional reactions but don't actually go to what the fundamental mm. issues are. Yeah. It is very hard in that environment yeah. for a layperson to be able to tell the difference between the show and the real. Mm. Well, at this moment, um, Ms. Malindogui, I want to give the last question to you. Uh, sentiments are high in both countries, in China and in the Philippines, because of the recent uh, confrontations, let's say, between um, people, between um, service people from both countries in the South China Sea. Uh, what can be done, or must be done, before we can have a bit more rationality when we approach uh, on both sides? I think um, with the recent kind of skirmishes in the South China Sea, especially last June 17, and you know the, all of these things that is happening between the two sides, I think one thing is very important, though, especially on our side, the Philippines, is the media. The media really has to be responsible in trying to report. You know, it should not exaggerate, but it should report based on facts and based on what actually happened. It should not editorialize because this makes things more complicated and also you know layman people will never understand exactly what is the real issue in the south china sea what do you mean by sovereign rights sovereignty dispute and all this so the media really has to play a constructive role in in this regard especially if there are certain things happening in the south china sea the other side i think is both sides the philippines and china should commit to de-escalate tension in the South China Sea, not because of anything. It's it's really precisely because it's the only way forward. You know, both sides should use diplomacy. Diplomacy is the answer to everything. We we cannot afford to have any other kind of conflict or military conflict in that area because that will affect the whole region and the whole region will suffer. The other side is I think the Philippines should really be more sincere and open-minded and commit to that diplomacy. And I really hope that diplomacy and negotiation and talks will reign and will be the, the way forward for both countries because this is mm -hmm. very important. Okay. I don't believe in other way but yeah. diplomacy. We have to leave it there. I believe that's the shared wish of many people. Thank you so much to my guests, uh, Yan Yan, Director of Research Center of Oceans Law and Policy at National Institute for South China Sea Studies, Warwick Powell, adjunct professor of Queensland University of Technology, and Anna Rosalia Malindogui, Vice President for External Affairs of Asian Central Philippine Strategic Studies Institute. And with that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and X using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got The Point. <laughs>